But now, let's go to last night. Benjamin Baker of New Zealand playing the luscious third movement of Mozart's Quintet in G minor last night at the Auckland Town Hall. And that work was the choice of four of the six semi-finalists over the last two days. Well, the finals have, finalists have been announced. Ben Baker will join Ioana Cristina Gochea of Romania and Luke Su from the US in the final tomorrow night. will each will play a concerto with the Auckland Philharmonic Orchestra. Away from the spotlight, there are considerable costs to pay for the privilege of having a career as a musician. In today's show, we'll hear about what goes on beneath the surface. Firstly, Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra music director Giordano Bellincampi exudes calm and charisma and looks to have a wonderful rapport with his players. But he says it takes all his powers of perception to empower musicians, especially soloists. So my role is to make music with them. It's actually in a way very simple, Uh, kind of try to get the focus away from the competitive moment but and go straight into the music, Uh, try to uh, trying to get to know the the three musicians I will have with me and have them work together with the with the APO in a way that is uh, constructive and creative uh, and trying to within five or ten minutes to get away from the nervous feeling of Oh, I'm watched by someone. That that is actually the the, the main thing, in order to make good music, which uh, helps everybody. You want them to forget about the audience, to forget about or not forget. Well, may, maybe not forget about the audience, but uh, to be honest, I think it's good if they forget about the panel. They are wonderful jurors. It's it's not about that, but um, if if we are as musicians, if you are afraid of doing something wrong very rarely we can do something really right. It's more about doing things right and feeling free and inspired and taking chances. This is actually what what we want to do. And I'm sure they they all want to do that and all musicians want to do that. But in in a competition, the psychology is sometimes a little different. Sometimes they're so held up by fear. Exactly. So constricted that it affects you. And also you can be quite tired after, Mm. after... performing so many different different styles of music over so many days. So, yeah, as I hope, and I have done competition, solo's competitions before, uh, I know how important it is to, to, to establish a good uh, musical relationship right away. So, Do you just talk? I mean, what do you do? Oh, well, uh, you know, meeting with soloists, and this is not about particularly about this competition, but in general, when you meet a new soloist, there is... A, there's a way you get you get experience in trying to find out which kind of person is this and also which kind of musician so very often it's like of course a polite introduction you say hello how are you blah 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 but not too much not too much talking then go straight into please play a little something for me and then I listen I try I try to listen and find out ah okay this is a person whose who musicianship goes in this direction in this direction um, Knowing the repertoire they are playing, they are, it's very well-known repertoire, I can then predict, oh, we might need to, to check this, or to this we should not touch, because this would be perfect uh, anyway. So, uh, yeah, so I listen a little, we have a little kind of a, a rehearsal with a pianist, 
but uh, I hope not too much because it should not be like, once again, we should keep kind of a creative atmosphere. So you're a psychologist, really, aren't you? Well, that's, that's part of the... Con- I mean... Seriously, it is seriously, what you have to do. Seriously. I mean, as a conductor, but this, this is also with, with the orchestra. It is, of course, we have a technical part of it you, you, and, and about the preparation of the music and, and, and you, you need to know where you want to go and you need to know what you, what you have to do with your hands and your technique. But the, the privilege and the curse of the conductor is that we don't make any sound ourselves. So we, we, we need to make everyone else to do the sounds that, that the composer would like to do or that we believe the composer would like to, to have. And that requires some psychologist uh, skills. The other thing is these players may not be experienced with orchestra. Mm. This Mm. may be the first time they've had to step onto a big stage and a big hall and project. Yes. And once again, uh, I think if, if you tell people remember now you're going on a big stage, you have to project, then you, you achieve the opposite. That's right. <laughs> so, so it is very much about uh, letting the music grow. And of course, when you play Brahms or Tchaikovsky or Sibelius or Prokofiev, uh, the music itself is so big and it is so strong that the musicianship will, will lead you. I, I very much believe, but this is not particularly about the competitors this week, but this is about musicians in general. The, the less we can let our brain work in, in ways, I have to think about this and this, and simply let, let the musical flow go through you and, and, and play, uh, it's, it's easier. And, and they are so, so well prepared, I know they were well prepared. Of course, you need a lot of technical issues has to be solved, but I, I know that they have worked a lot on that, and that is not what we should focus on those two days. So what if you have somebody who's being the soloist, and you can tell that there's a lot of energy being suppressed and mm. that they can't seem to get it out. How yeah. can you help them in that oh, situation? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a, a difficult task. It depends on the personality. Some people need a lot of encouragement, uh, which can be purely kind of gesture or, or eyes and you can send some kind of positive atmosphere. Oh, you're doing well, it's, it's going fine. Uh, sometimes you need to uh, uh, distract by bringing focus on something else. So if, if I sense, for instance, uh, that, that a soloist is very, very nervous and is playing quite nervously and has started on the wrong foot uh, on a concerto, I might, after five, seven, eight minutes of the rehearsal, stop and then work on something in the orchestra, you know, like basses and celli, let's do like this although maybe it's not really what, it, what it's all about. But it's, it's in order to make this person feel, oh, it's not only about me. Um, if people are locked up and I can find an opportunity to make people laugh in a, in, with the music, uh, then, then it helps. Then there's those other people, Giordano, who appear to be very confident and calm, yeah. but this is purely exterior. Yes. Yeah. Underneath, they're yeah. too scared. When you say, have yeah. you got any problems, anything you want to talk yeah. about, they say, no, no. No, no. Because yeah. they don't want to tell you what they're exactly. worried about. What do exactly. you do then? Yeah, th- this, is, this is also why I, I, I tend not to ask too much. Uh. Because, because the words, words are not nothing, really. We, we can, as soon as we start talking about music, it's... Uh, it's a waste of really, time. <laughs> yeah, and it actually destroys. If, if someone has this kind of a say, it's really, really uh, big. Once again, it helps to kind of crackle down your own facade, I try to do that, and use some self-irony, so they can see that it's okay, uh, that, that we are not all perfect. Now it sounds like uh, uh, I'm thinking about those things all the time, which I'm, which I'm not, but, but it is part of, of my daily life as a conductor, because this is exactly the same when, when, when you conduct the orchestra. Uh, a lot of people would have passages that they have feared all, the, all their lives when they, I mean, if you're, if you're a bassoon player and you have to start Sacre de Pointin or then start the, the phone, the Debussy phone, th- those things, it is very much about projecting the, uh, the trust in the fact that they will be able to do it. And uh, often it helps. We're speaking with uh, Maestro Giordano Bellancampi from the Auckland Philharmonic Orchestra talking about the final, the big final for the 2017 Michael Hill Violin Competition. 
that's, that's once again, it's a big privilege. For instance, this week, working with these smiling concertos, which we have done so many times, every time something new uh, comes up. And so even if one of the person who's playing, who's selected to play the Brahms, if he, Ben Baker, should get through to the final round, you've just done Brahms with Ilya Gringotts. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah but that, How do you adjust to such a different oh, player? Oh, no, that's, that's actually... No problem? No, that's really no problem. You know, the wonderful thing about orchestra musicians is that they have a very short memory. So. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, sometimes if you ask an orchestra, so what did you play last week? They oh, can't, it's they last can't, week. Exactly, they can't really remember. Which is, for us conductors, uh, is very often a good thing because you start, every day starts fresh. Sometimes you can get a little frustrated. You think, oh, I just said this last week, but then, then it's okay. But that's why you love it. No yes. two days are ever the same. No, exactly. The opening of Nielsen's Third Symphony, live recording from Giordano Bellincampi with the APO two weeks ago. And Giordano Bellincampi leads the grand finale concert tomorrow night for the Michael Hill. We really hear about the emotional toll that being a musician can take. Andrew Beer is concertmaster of the APO. He was in Queenstown last weekend doing Insider's Guides, talks from violinists to give audiences more understanding of the challenges of being a violinist, as he explains. Insider's Guide, so we sort of talk about the music that's being performed by all the candidates, and I focused on Paganini and Salon pieces and the sonatas that the candidates were playing. Basically, 25 minutes to talk as much about what's going on as possible. How do you think that helps the audience, Andrew? Well, what I tried to do is play a lot of specific examples, describe it to them in as clear terms as possible, and then just play so that when they hear it again during the competition, they hopefully appreciate it a little bit more. In your um, estimation, that round, those initial rounds in Queenstown, where each competitor has to play the Bach, Sonatas or Fugues, the Paganini Caprices, how hard is that for each of these players to front up in a new country and present this material? I'd say it's probably the hardest part of the competition, not just Bach and Paganini, but also um, the commission piece, of course. Oh, the piece by Carla Margatich Carla this year? Carla Margatich this year, yeah. Um, they get to choose their own piece, and there was yet another added challenge this year. They each had to introduce the piece they chose, so despite having to play all the music, they also had to, you know, get up there and give a five-minute speech. Oh, no, that's very hard to do. <laughs> Definitely. So what do you think it did for um, them as individuals, being forced to present themselves? It's a great learning experience, and I think it's one of the things that Michael Hill Competition emphasizes, not just the performance aspect, but to make it today as top performers, we need to be able to do pub public speaking, be good teachers. So this is a challenge that's going to enhance their careers. In terms of the players themselves and their um, ability in a foreign country to 
relax and find something they can relate to in the music. What, what's that sort of what's that mind tease like, Andrew? For the competitors for from the overseas. Competitors, yeah. Um, it must be a challenge, although I think, again, Michael Hill does a great job, Michael Hill Competition does a great job of hosting them with people that are very supportive, maybe, maybe helping them to know New Zealand culture, making them feel really relaxed and at home. Uh, I see a lot of the photos from the competition, the ones going up online, and it seems like all the competitors are having a great time. It's so weird, but it's great. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Did you do competitions? I did a couple competi- international competitions um, in my 20s. Um, I was really nervous for it, and um, I did, didn't win any of them, but it was still a great experience. To be honest, if if I could go back and do everything again, I would do more competitions because it helps us grow so much as violinists and, and musicians. Does it make you tougher? It makes you tougher. It makes you prepare a lot of music in a really short amount of time and then just get up there and do it. There's nothing it's, like it. I'm interested to know about the international um, career path at the moment. There seems to be more and more incredibly brilliant players, younger and younger, Andrew. What, what is the career path like these days? Career path in general in, for violinists? In terms of violinists, people who might be, I don't know, 21, 22, thinking about how they're going to, I don't know, get ahead. Yeah, I, I guess when everyone's really young, they, they have this image of being a soloist. And then for a lot of people as they get older, that's not realistic anymore. So we look at orchestra path, chamber music, teaching, those, those will be the main paths and everyone can choose one or, or try and go for all at once. But I think a, an important thing to say is that competitions can help you on any career path. It's just, it just gives great exposure. What, what made you decide to become a concertmaster, to be an orchestral player? Well, I always enjoyed playing an orchestra and it felt something that I was quite strong at. Also, when I was graduating from high school, I asked my violin teacher, well, be honest, what do you th- can I make it? What do you think What do you think's the best possible outcome for my career? And he said, I think you'll be a concertmaster. So, yeah. That requires a particular personality type, doesn't it? Personality type, yes, and also a specific skill set. I think you have to be pretty quick as a concertmaster. You're good at sight reading, good, great ears as well, being able to adjust to everything that's going on around you and to be a good communicator with your orchestra. And establishing that rapport, like when you first came to join the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra, you know, new person coming to new orchestra, how was that settling in period for you? Um, the musical aspects were just fine. I've, I've always loved leading. Some of the non-musical aspects were new for me, definitely. You know, going to meetings, like the public speaking, like we spoke about, um, those, those were more challenges for me. What about the cultural aspect? Oh, people are so nice in New Zealand. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Absolutely, I love it here. <laughs> and is it true that we're a bit like you? The Canadians and New Zealanders so. have got a lot in common. I think so, yeah. You know, the Canadians have the Americans, um, the sort of the bigger neighbour nearby, like, like we have the Aussies here, so there's a lot of similarities. So this weekend, Saturday night, are you involved? Are you the concertmaster? Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, I'll, boy. Be, I'll be sitting there, <laughs> right next to the, all the three of the candidates. Do you think they require, at that point, the three people who make it through to the orchestral performance on Saturday... What do you think they require from the orchestra? The orchestra's main job would just be to support them, to, said most basically to make them sound as good as possible. So obviously always staying below them, never drowning them out, even inspiring them during the 2D sections when they're not playing to help sort of give them some energy to keep going. Um, also in rehearsals, maybe if they're not feeling so confident, I could just go over and give them a little pep talk or something, whatever we can do to help them. And is it easy to tell who needs an extra bit of encouragement. Yeah, you can always read their body language or just w- what they're saying to the conductor, how they're interacting with the orchestra. Some are a lot more experienced than others, so the ones with less experience might need a little more encouragement. Because you're sitting there, presumably you're on the right of the conductor and the soloist is often right in front of you, Andrew. That's right. The soloist is in between me and the conductor. Yeah. yeah, so you are the perfect person to read the body language, aren't you? Yeah, I'm right there. And I also have the best seat in the house. <laughs> Do you um, ever feel... That you'd rather be that person, the soloist? Oh no, that's a scary experience. I'm very happy to sit in the concertmaster chair. <laughs> what do you think it takes, personality-wise, to want to be and to be able to carry off that solo role? Yeah, I think you could be an extrovert or an introvert, but you need a great inner confidence. It really takes a lot of confidence to get up there because there's so many doubts in the moment and you just have to put them aside. But and you have to have doubts in order to get better, don't you? 
in the practice room, but you, sh you shouldn't have doubts on stage. <laughs> so if you do, if you're unsure of how you should interpret a particular passage, if, if doubts creep in, what do you do? Oh, you, you just have to say, this is the way I'm doing it, and I, in the moment, I'm right, and this is how I feel it. I'm feeling it, and I'm going to play it that way. Nothing else. You never go back and go, oh, I should have done it that way? Oh, afterwards, of course. <laughs> Just never on stage. <laughs> What's that moment like after everybody's gone home? Everyone's left the concert hall. What's the letdown like? For me, it's pretty big. I, I'm always feeling all the moments where it didn't go well, could, could have done better, could have taken a little more time here. Maybe I didn't speak what the composer wanted the most. It's pretty tough. Um, so what do you do to make sure you don't let yourself get overwhelmed by that? Afterwards? Hmm. Oh, just make mental notes and say I'll do it differently the next time. Are you the sort of person who goes out and has a drink, or what are you? Depends. I'll go out and have a drink if, if I wasn't too negative about what just happened. Otherwise, I'll go home and brood, probably. <laughs> Would you really? Yeah. <laughs> so you're, quite, you're very hard on yourself then, Andrew. I am. I guess a lot of musicians are, though, right? That's how we got to where we are. But you've still got to get the joy, don't you? You've got to appreciate what you've been able to achieve. And if you doubt too much or do too much self-flagellation, then it might be too hard to come out again and do it again next week. I think you're right. Maybe it's about the timing. So the flagellation happens right after the concert, and then the next morning, let's move on. Let's see the positives. <laughs> <laughs> I really admire you. I think it's incredible because I know people, people don't actually think about what happens after mm. everyone's gone home. But mm. that can be a very lonely moment. It is, yeah. I re actually remember touring um, Vietnam with Midori. We were playing some quartet concerts. And after every concert, I was, we were staying in hotel rooms next to each other. After every concert, she'd go back and just practice for three hours. And then she'd wake up at six in the morning and practice another four hours. That's the kind of work ethic she has. And there's a lot of people like that out there. I'm not like that, but there's people like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, what, how many hours of practice do you do to keep yourself in shape? Well, to be honest, I practice less than I used to. I'm starting to get older. I'm 35 now. And physically, it's not as easy as it used to be. So I have to be a little careful about not over-practicing. Um, I remember when I was in my 20s and preparing for competitions, I'd be practicing eight hours a day. I never do that anymore. Well, you can, get, you can stuff your neck for a start, can't you? Yeah. Or some other part of your anatomy, your hands, your fingers, yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's right. So I guess that's also something to bear in mind for these players, that they don't go back and spend too many hours playing. Because sometimes you can rehearse in your head, can't you? Yeah, yeah. I used to um, put myself to sleep by practicing the violin in, <laughs> in my mind and my fingers. <laughs> so if you hadn't been a violinist, what would you have done? Um, I always had a fantasy of being a lawyer as a kid, because I, I thought I was good at the sort of things required for that, but uh, I'm much happier, I think, being a violinist, so I think it turned out okay.
Tsiong Kang winning the Michael Hill Violin Competition in 2017. And she was playing Sibelius the Violin Concerto in 2015, I mean. Well, international juror Dong Suk Kang was the first Korean violinist to place in the famous Queen Elizabeth competition. He moved to study in the United States at a time when there were very few musicians from Asia there. Now the tables are turned and there are many. He now teaches in Seoul. I asked Professor Kang about the pressures going on students in Korea. There is a big problem because everybody knows that that you know the the, the students are working way too hard. Yeah, you know, too many hours know, a day. Not, right? only, not only you know music, but in in you know other fields also. You know they because it's so competitive and they want to go to best schools or you know the junior high school or high school or whatever they they work. After school, they continue working. You know, they have private uh, tutors, or, or they, so so they continuously work uh, throughout the day until midnight. I don't know when. So it's like they are completely exhausted mentally and physically, and and so the result is there. They they are very brilliant, but at the same time, I don't know if it's on, on you know long term whether it's it's a very healthy sort of system. To people are aware of this problem and they're trying to do something about it, but it's not so simple. Well, I guess it makes people very good very quickly, early yeah, in their yeah, career, yeah. but will they still be able to, if they're, for instance, violinist, will they yeah. still be able to play when they're 40 or 50? Well, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they get the result, which is good, very quickly, because they work hard, but, you know, I think in music, it's not just the just mechanical side that you practice and you play well, you know, but I think you need to you need time to, to think and you need to time to mature and all that. And so I think you need to develop your own personality and all that. So, you know, uh, that's something that's perhaps lacking among the, the Korean music students. Uh, do you yeah. think it's particular to Korea or do we see students in other countries also going through this very high pressure yeah, system? Yeah, I think it, it probably... In general, that's probably the case in Asia, you know, because of the, the our background, the culture, and also, you know, they are more disciplined because of, you know, their culture and the education that you have to be very obedient and you have to work hard, you have to listen to the teachers and all that. So that's good in a way, but at the same time, that takes away a little bit of, you know, the, the creativity or the individuality that, that, that's required in, in music. So... So now, you know, you see that, that there are some uh, young students um, winning some international competition uh, coming directly from Korea. You know, they, there are many who study abroad and, and participate in different competitions, but now there are some who come directly from Korean schools and, and win competitions. So that's a big difference between what was happening like two or three decades ago. And, well, and like now. when you went, yeah. when you went to America. Yeah, when I, I, when mean, I you did were one of half a dozen. I, I was one of the very few. I was, a very, I was the first one to win a prize in the Queen Elizabeth competition, for instance, from Korea and all that. So now things have changed enormously. <laughs> you know, well, I was reading that about 30 to 40% of the students at um, Juilliard are yeah. from Korea. Yeah, yeah they're everywhere. That's the, yeah, but it's, it's, it's a little bit strange because it's paradoxical because uh, now the enrollment in music schools in Korea is, is, is diminishing. So what, the numbers? Yeah, numbers, you know, so I think now they're, they turn to sports or, you know, as you know, the golfers, you know, ladies, uh, they, they're, you know... The, Lydia Ko, yeah. The, now they turn to some other, you know, um, the, the, the fields and not just music and, and, and maybe it's more lucrative also. <laughs> So, uh, so it's an interesting phenomenon, but um, I think, uh, you know, uh, now they are more successful at the same time, maybe because the general level of, of, of music making and, and educate music uh, the, the teaching and all that is much, much higher now in Korea than it used to be. You know, when I was young, I had to leave Korea because there was no choice because, uh, you know, it was in a very... Uh, a primitive stage yet, you know, the music, uh, the scene in Korea. So I had to go abroad to study, but now it's a quite a different story. And I, I imagine that the orchestras have also got a lot better. Yeah, there of course. Are yeah, many yeah, more places yeah, to get a yeah, job once yeah. you finish your studies. Yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, there are many orchestras, but um, perhaps it's linked to the, 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 
the person, the character of Koreans, uh, uh, they are, you know, what Koreans are called the Italians of of the, of the East. So they are very uh, individualist, you know. There, uh, so so maybe in music that's good, but as a team, they're not as efficient as the Japanese or the Germans, you know. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So, yeah. So that's uh, so orchestras compared to individual, the achievement that the, the Korean musicians. Um, were able to achieve it until now, uh, the level of Korean orchestra is not quite on on a very very you know a high standard approach world class, but you know nothing more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dong Suk Kang from Yonsei University in Korea is uh, one of the judges for the Michael Hill International Violin Competition 2017. What are you looking for now? You no, know, I'm I'm always looking for some. A, a personality, not just somebody, a machine who can play perfectly everything, you know, no fault, no, you know, nothing to, but at the, at the end of the day, does he or does she say something to you, does, does, you know, does it, does he or he, she, she uh, touch you, you know, I think that's the most important test, so uh, you don't need to analyze too many things, sometimes you just have to, you know, go by your Instinct. Instinct and, and, and you know, because uh, that's, after all, that's what music is all about. So, uh, you know, I'm looking for a, a need individuality. Uh, you know, even if I don't agree with, the, the, you know, their approach, you know, I think someone who can say something individual, I think that's very important. You know. Ben Baker playing Mozart's Quintet in G minor last night with Justine Cormack, Gillian Ansell, Julia Joyce and Ashley Brown. Uh, tomorrow night's final broadcast live from Auckland Town Hall at 7.30, courtesy of RNZ Concerts' Tim Dodd and Adrian Holle. It'll start with Luke Sue from USA playing Sibelius, Ioana Christina Gochea of Romania is second with Tchaikovsky, and Ben Baker with Brahms will complete the lineup. So live coverage from tomorrow night at 7.30. And an interview on Monday, hopefully, with a winner.